Happy day, everyone, and welcome to the grade 12 radio drama performance of The Four Just Men by Edgar Wallace. My name is Miss Conrad, and it has been my pleasure directing these wonderful students in this production. Now, you'll notice we're not on stage right now. Well, that's because we're kind of doing something a little bit different this go around. You are about to experience a radio drama, which is a very little known genre of theater, but very fun to explore. So you will have two options for your viewing experience tonight. You may simply just continue watching as is and see all of the magic unfold before your eyes. Or if you want the true radio drama experience, close your eyes. Or even better yet, Find an activity to do and just shut off your monitor and listen to the magic that these students have created. So without further ado, please lean in and engage in our production of The Four Just Men by Edgar Wallace, presented by the grade 12 drama class here at Glendale Prep. Cheers! We are in the Spanish port city of Cadiz, way back in the last years of the 19th century. It is 1898 to be exact. It is a warm afternoon and four men are sitting around a table in the cafe. Three of them, well dressed and obviously affluent, seem at ease with themselves in the world. The fourth is shabbier in appearance and appears somewhat nervous. But I still don't quite understand why you asked me to come and meet you. My dear Terry. I may call you Terry, senor. Of course. Perhaps we should all get better acquainted. My name, as you know, is Alice Manfred. But my two friends here, I don't think you've been introduced. To my right, senor Leon Gonzalez. The light said you came, Terry. And to my left, monsieur Raymond Poicard. My pleasure, Terry. Senors. Of course, the name under which we operate was known to you before we made contact. I think it's known to half of Europe. But very few people can put a face to us. You're greatly privileged, Harry. By meeting you like this, we're putting our safety in your hands. I understand, Senor Manfred. And it makes me nervous. Why have the most famous criminals in the world entrusted me with this knowledge? Criminals? No, no, you're mistaken, Harry. Dispensers of justice. Justice that corrupt law enforcers refuse to dispense. Senors, I apologize. I meant no offense. And none taken, Terry, I assure you. Look at it this way. Over the past five years, a dozen highly placed individuals, criminals, if you like, who have done terrible things, but who thought themselves beyond the law, have been brought to book. They have paid a just price for their misdeeds. Unfortunately, during the course of our last enterprise, we lost one of our number. And our new enterprise requires a certain skill that we believe you possess. I'm honored beyond belief. Monsieur Poica, but I have no part in whatever it is that set you all on this path. An injustice so grave, so overwhelming, so deeply embedded in the corrupt system of a certain country, so clearly requiring to be remedied. Terry, you do not need to have shared in the deep injustice that brought us together, an injustice that motivates us to this day. Let our relationship be on a purely business footing. We've been told that you are a patriotic Spaniard, I am indeed, Senor Gonzalez. And you support the movement for independence? The movement that aims to free the Spanish people from the yoke of this corrupt monarchy that has been foisted upon them? Of course, long live our great leader, Manuel Garcia. He's the only man who can lead our movement to victory. The only one. You're right, Terry. He is. And it's his life that we're trying to save. About six months ago, news reached us that the secret police were about to arrest him, put him on trial, and have him executed. And so we spirited him away to England. He's safe enough there for the moment. And he continues his work from London, planning the great revolution. They will one day... But enough of that. Because, because now... Now he faces terrible danger. England's foreign secretary is about to bring in a law that is Garcia's death warrant. That law will give the British authorities the power to deport anyone they call 
an undesirable alien, back to their country of origin. If that law gets onto the statute book, they will seize Garcia and send him back to Spain, where he will assuredly be silenced forever. This is something we cannot allow. The future of Spain is in our hands. Nor is he the only one. There are at least five other exiled leaders living and walking in Britain who are dedicated to freeing their country from tyranny. We will either succeed in getting the British Foreign Secretary to stop that law being introduced, or you will kill him, one or the other. Terry, we need you, and we are all wealthy enough to ensure that you will be generously rewarded if you join us. Are you with us? Your cause is just. I am. Excellent. Now, I have here a document. This, I think, is an exact copy of the description of yourself held in Spanish police headquarters. Really? See here, is that your trade? It certainly is. I know everything about this. Everything. If I hadn't made a big mistake a few years ago, I could have earned a very great deal of money. I'd be as wealthy as you are. We just needed it confirmed. Excellent. Then there's no doubt about it. If that English government minister, Sir Philip Raymond, refuses to give way, and I fear that is exactly what he will do, then he's a dead man. Now, Raymond, what's all this about threatening letters? It's true, Prime Minister. I've received quite a number over the past month or so. You inform the police? Of course. They've been of little use. The letters keep arriving. That's why I've advertised a reward of £50 for any information leading to the arrest of the perpetrators. The papers are full of it this morning. Have you any idea who they might be, Raymond? Indeed I have, Prime Minister. All the letters are signed, The Four Just Men. You'll have heard of them, I presume. A band of vigilantes killing people they don't approve of. Precisely. And I've been added to their list, it seems. I presume it's your aliens extradition bill that excites the disapproval. Unless I abandon the bill, they threaten to assassinate me. Good heavens. Her Majesty's government can't give way to threats, Raymond. Indeed, we cannot, Prime Minister. Come. A letter, Prime Minister, delivered by hand. It's marked personal and urgent. Thank you. Who delivered this? I can't say, sir. I did ask, but I was told it was found on the hall table. Good grief. What is it, Prime Minister? My dear Prime Minister, your government is about to pass a law that will remove from Britain a number of patriots who could be the saviors of their nations. One in particular, Manuel Garcia, you would hand over to the most evil government of modern times. We have informed the minister concerned that unless he withdraws this bill, we will surely slay him. As proof that we are capable of doing so, we would ask you to look under the side table in your office that stands beneath the portrait of the Duke of Wellington. If that machine contained a detonator or a fuse, which it does not, it could destroy a substantial part of the Palace of Westminster. Yours sincerely, the four just men. Raymond, under that table. No, there. What's that package? Do you mean this, Prime Minister? Careful. Be careful. Gently. Bring it here, on the desk. What is it? What is it, Commissioner? A hoax? I'm afraid not, Prime Minister. It's just what the letter described, even to the absence of a fuse. Was it really...? Enough to wreck a large chunk of this building. But how was it brought into this very office? Frankly, sir, we've no idea. Of course, every single policeman on duty, both inside and outside Parliament, has been questioned and cross-questioned. Not one of them remembers seeing anyone unauthorized entering or leaving. I see. Thank you, Commissioner. Osborne, have the press secretary prepare a statement of what has happened. Issue it as quickly as possible. We can't keep this under wraps. And Commissioner, you may announce that the government is offering a reward of a thousand pounds for the arrest of whoever gained access to my office and left that machine. Oh, and a free pardon to any accomplice. Well done, Poicard. The evening papers are full of it. Thanks to you, Manfred. You planned it perfectly. Not a hitch, then. Just one. As the members were filing out to vote, I saw someone glance at me. 
he said to the MP beside him. I thought uh, Basco had arranged to be away this evening. But then he shrugged and I went on into the voting lobby. Thank goodness. Of course, it was only because the MPs were voting that you had the chance to slip into the Prime Minister's office. And you are quite right, Manfred. It was the last vote of the night and the staff had all gone. But no one would have questioned me anyway. I was the spit and image of Sir Emmanuel Basco MP. Rather ye than me, Paca. Now this is rather jolly. Nothing like a good old English music hall. What progress, Falmouth? None, Commissioner. How can you catch people when you haven't the slightest idea of who or what you're looking for? They've committed crimes in almost every country in the world, and we've still no idea who they are. For all we know, they could be two women based in the heart of Africa, calling themselves the four just men just to put us off the trail. What about this letter? The handwriting? Doesn't that give us a clue? It's the sort of hand taught in Latin countries. France? Spain, Portugal, Italy, and indeed, Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. But it might be a deliberate fake, and probably is. As you can see, the English itself is impeccable. So you think they're British? I'm not saying that, sir. Just that whoever wrote that letter has perfect English. It's no help. There's still no clue as to who they are. So, what have you done, Falmouth? Well, we've combed the major cities. London, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow. Police holding cells are crammed full of people waiting to be questioned. It's all a long shot. We don't really think the underworld has anything to do with it. This is not good enough. Downing Street, the Prime Minister himself, the demanding action. Surely there's more we can do. One thing we are doing is to guard Sir Philip Raymond. I'm leading a six-man protection team to see I see Sir Philip daily. He's determined to carry this bill of his through Parliament. Says he won't be cowed by idle threats. The threats may not be idle. So I try to tell him. He takes no notice. So beyond keeping him under our close protection, there's very little more we can do. Except wait. The four just men, a link to the Mafia. Facts point to a Sicilian connection. Evidence is emerging that the Costa Nostra are directly involved. A traitor in Parliament. Someone who works within the Palace of Westminster is in league with the shadowy organization that calls itself the Four Just Men. We have clear proof that the Four Just Men are the infamous Corsican brothers, the gang that held New York to ransom back in the 60s. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your permission, I have a brief statement to make. Honorable members will be aware that a few weeks ago, I introduced the Aliens Extradition Political Offenses Bill on behalf of the government, and that outside interests are threatening my life if it is not withdrawn. It goes without saying that the government has no intention of giving way to blackmail. Yeah. As for myself, I refuse to be intimidated by common criminals. Yeah. Yeah. May I add that this law has been welcomed by a number of governments friendly to this nation. Many have long regretted the fact that individuals and organizations intent on fomenting unrest in their native lands have found sanctuary in this country and been permitted to continue their nefarious activities. I shall, therefore, as previously announced, be moving the second reading of the bill on Thursday the 27th of this month, that is, in 10 days time. A military band. How very English. I thought it would be a pleasant way to meet Gonzales. The park, some music. What's our friend Terry up to today? Paca is showing him the sights. Buckingham Palace. The Tower of London, you know, keeping him occupied. Very wise. Manfred, are we ready? I've taken a place. It's time we came together. Is everything there? Almost everything. Here's the address. Tell Paca, will you? Let's move in, bag and baggage, tomorrow at noon. Well, you see, years ago, when I first came to London, I learned that the easiest way to conceal your identity was to disguise yourself as a public company. 
That's why I purchased these old printing works and registered the four of us as the directors of Etherington's Fine Arts Reproduction Limited. You've given our names to the authorities? Good heavens no, Terry. You're James Leach, artist. I am Eloise W. Knight, managing director. And I? You, Pokar, can choose. Would you rather be James Selkirk, artist, or Andrew Cohen, financial agent? I'd rather be the money man. Then I'll indulge my artistic temperament. Excellent. Now, we'll live up here on the third floor. You saw that the old printing presses are all on the ground floor. The first floor was the workshop, and the second was a store. Up here, in addition to our living quarters, they kept the cameras and arc lamps. Their equipment was all included in the deal. How much longer before anything happens? Patience, my dear Terry. Things are moving ahead. No, I'm tired of this life. You won't let me out of the doors without a guard. I'm not your guard, Terry. You are. You stay with me night and day. I want to go back home to Spain. I was a free man there. I'm sorry I came. Don't make me sorry. For your own sake, Terry. I don't want to kill anybody. But you don't want Garcia killed either. Which he surely will be as soon as he sets foot in Spain again. And that's precisely what Sir Philip Raymond has in mind. But to murder the man? Isn't there some other way? Yes, Terry. If he withdraws that bill, otherwise not. Who are you? Why are you keeping me prisoner? You don't let me see the newspapers. You don't let me walk alone in the streets. I mustn't speak to anybody. You want me to kill, but you won't say how. Terry, be patient. I beg you. We'll lift the restrictions a little. We'll get the daily papers. Let's eat out this evening. A Spanish restaurant. What do you say to that? Thank you. But I wish I was more comfortable about what you are asking me to do. Listen, Terry. We do not kill for gain. Poca here and Gonzales each have fortunes in excess of six million pesetas. I am even wealthier. We kill only in cases where the law of the land is unable to provide a remedy for injustice or corruption. If we kill you, Terry, it will be the first time we've ever acted in such a way. Me? Kill me? We've never acted unjustly. Not once. But to kill you would be a most unjust thing. Don't make us do it. Terry. Not one hair of your head will be harmed if you stay faithful to us. That I swear, senor. Be patient for just a few days longer. Then we'll all return to Spain and you will be a wealthy man for the rest of your life. And that young lady in Jerez, awaiting your return, she can have a wedding she'll never forget. Are you with us? To the editor, the megaphone. Dear madam, we offer you profound apologies for any inconvenience caused to you or your staff this evening. We fear that when you switched on your desk light, the mild explosion must have plunged a section of your press room into darkness. We trust you were not too shocked. The detonation was caused by a small plug of magnesium inserted into the light socket. Please believe that it would have been just as simple to use a charge of nitroglycerin, in which case you would have been your own executioner. We arranged this demonstration to prove our firm intention to carry out our promise in respect of the aliens' extradition bill. No power on earth can save Sir Philip Raymond if he persists with this measure. We ask you, as editor of a leading newspaper, to oppose the terrible injustice that this law will impose on many innocent people, some of them very distinguished, who are seeking asylum in your country. We beg you to call on your government to withdraw the bill and thus also save the life of a minister of the crown. Signed, The Four Just Men. Outrage at the megaphone. Just four again. Oh, is it done? Another frightening letter. The four to keep their promise. Can the police save Sir Philip Raymond? Absolutely terrifying, Wilby. But it's given us an exclusive. We're upping our print tonight. I guarantee an extra 25,000 at least on the circulation tomorrow. The rest of Fleet Street will be green with envy. Yes? What do you want? John Mill wants to speak to someone. He talks all foreign-like. Couldn't really make him out. Fought Mr. Welby. Where is he? Right here behind me, sir. Oh, all right. Be off with you. Hello, sir. What do you want? Can I help you? I want the editor. I must speak with the editor. I am the editor. Who are you? My name is Miguel Terry. I'm one of the four just men. A 
box is always best in the concert hall. It gives us privacy and we can talk. Fast effort, then being followed back to the printing works. If everything had gone wrong, how did it go? Not a hitch. I waited till the editor left the building, then went to reception and asked to see him. Regrets, but not possible. <laughs> I wander off, round to the back of the building, slip inside papers from the briefcase, look purposeful and in a hurry. Up the stairs, down the corridor, to the editor's room. People around, but knock, wait and enter. Fix the desk lamp, place a letter on the desk, leave. Call a few farewell words as I close the door, out and away. Full marks, Manfred. But uh, we've some bad news, I'm afraid. What? What is it? Perry has escaped. Not good. What's he up to? He doesn't know London. He wouldn't know what to do, where to go. Uh, this morning, before you left, you gave him a uh, bundle of newspapers. That's right. I said I would. The offer of the reward and the free pardon was in the megaphone. I saw he was rather excited this morning. But I put it down to the fact that we told him last night just how we were going to kill Raymond and the part he was going to play. How did he get away? We went for a walk this afternoon uh, to Regent Street to look at the shops. We stopped to look into a photographer's window and then suddenly he was gone. There were so many people in the street, it was impossible to look at him. He just disappeared. With the full plan in his head. Manfred, listen. My car is quite close. We could get to our lunch in Essex in two hours. We could be in France before daybreak. What do you think, Gonzales? I say stay and finish the work. Actually, so do I. I agree. But we must find Harry. Where has he gone? Isn't it obvious to the newspaper that published the advertisement where you were this afternoon? You could have met at the entrance. He's gone to the megaphone. Terry, I don't know that name. Where do you come from? Perez, in Andalusia. He doesn't mean that. Where do you come from now? What part of London? How shall I know? There are houses, streets, people. They want me to kill a man, a minister. He made a wicked law. They? Who? The other three. Their names, man. Their names. You say there's reward and a free pardon. I want those before I tell. If you're one of the four, you'll have your reward. Just a moment. Connect me to the composing room. Hello, Skarga? Listen to me carefully. Stop the presses. Now. Yes, I do mean it. We may be remaking the front page. Come on, Scargo, we can spare 20 minutes. Now listen, not a man working down there is to leave this building until I give the word. Do you understand? Right. Now, Senor Terry, tell me all you know. Excuse me, I need to let this one... Not now, I'm busy. Go away. Senor Terry? There is a reward and a pardon. For heaven's sake, man, you'll get your reward and your pardon. Just tell us. Who are the other three men? Where are they to be found? Right here, gentlemen. And you, girl. Come on, stand with them. I don't want to waste a bullet on you. That's better. A little privacy. You are Ms. Manningham, the editor, I take it? I am, sir. And you? One of the three men you were looking after. The other two are waiting outside this building. Oh, and apologies for the minor explosion earlier this afternoon. I'm getting to know this office quite well. H how did you get here? And what do you want? One question at a time. Mr... Welby. Ah, the megaphone's distinguished for an editor. Well, how I came here, your doorkeeper will explain... when he comes to. He's out cold at the moment. And I'm here because I prefer to stay alive. Which would be unlikely if our friend Terry here gives you the information you're seeking. That's what I'm about to prevent. I have no quarrel with any of you. But if you try to stop me in any way, I'll have no alternative but to kill you. What exactly do you want? I want your word, yours and Miss Manningham's, that you will let the two of us leave this building without raising the alarm. We need three minutes, no more, from the moment we leave this room. And if not? Then you'll leave me with no alternative but to shoot you and Mr. Welby here and make our escape. You girl, you're in no danger. You trust our word? If the alarm goes off before we have left the building, I'll have to shoot my friend Terry. No, you can't. Say nothing, Terry. You'd have 
betrayed your comrades. You have foiled our plans, plans with a noble purpose. You will come with me and be thankful I haven't put a bullet in your head. Now, gentlemen, do I have your word? I agree, but under protest. Come on, Terry. On my word, as a caballero, I won't harm you. Uh, one moment! Yes? Look here. When you get home, will you write us an article about yourselves? The four just men. Your aspirations, what makes you do what you do. How about it? I'll publish whatever you write. Madam, I salute you. The article will be delivered tomorrow. It's not easy to understand why, having two miscreants standing before them, certain journalists connected with a sensational publication allowed them to get away scot-free to continue with their evil work. As a result, the life of a respected statesman is still under threat. This situation is intolerable. These four criminals must be identified and rounded up as soon as possible, and certainly well ahead of the aliens' extradition bill passing into law. Philip, I beg you. These men are ruthless. They have succeeded in everything. They penetrated the Prime Minister's private study. They got into the editor's office with the megaphone. Not once, but twice. Philip, please give way. They are determined to stop this bill. And I, my love, am equally determined to see it pass through Parliament and become the law of the land. Darling Philip, I admire your firmness of purpose and I admire your courage, but not at the expense of your life. You've seen what these men can do. Please, Philip, give way. Is the bill so vital? Jane, my dear, let me explain. Foreign agitators are taking advantage of our traditions of freedom, of free speech, of tolerance. We know of several such people intent on inciting revolution, of overthrowing the government in their own countries. They have fled to Britain so as to escape justice at home and continue their nefarious activities from here. Those governments are friends of ours. They are requesting, nay, demanding that we return these people so they can stand trial in their own countries for their crimes. Now do you see why this bill is so important? I see why it seems politically important to the government. If to would reinforce our good relations with a number of states we don't want to annoy, whether or not we agree with how they run their affairs. I do not approve of the Spanish regime, for instance, but I quite see that our government would not wish to break off our relations with Spain, not for the sake of one man, Manuel Garcia. Good gracious, Jane. I didn't realize you took such an interest in politics. I'm not surprised. I believe this is the first time since we are married that we've ever discussed politics. Then I'm at fault. I take it you have an interest in the British suffrage movement? I take a keen interest. I favor the call for women to have the vote. I hope that one day you will support it in Parliament? I'm afraid that day is some way off, my darling. Meanwhile, we have more urgent issues to deal with, like this alien's extradition bill. So... You're determined to press ahead? Absolutely. Then, I absolutely insist that you follow the security requirements of the police while the bill passes through Parliament. Oh, Jane. Yes, Philip, I insist. You must do exactly as the police instruct. You simply must. Oh, very well. Sir Philip, we're taking the threat very seriously. These men mean what they say, and they've proved they can overcome normal security measures. As a result, we've made certain plans. Plans? What plans? Sir Philip, would you please tell me about your bill? What is due to take place in two days' time? What we call the second reading. Two weeks ago, I introduced the bill to the House of Commons. That's just a formality. We call that the first reading. On Thursday evening, at exactly nine o'clock, I stand up in the House to present the details. There's a debate, and then the bill is launched, and we proceed to the next stage. And these Fordist men want you to abort the second reading, is that right? They threatened that unless you withdraw the bill, kill it, in fact, they will kill you. In short, they say that you will be dead before 8.30pm this coming Thursday. So I gather, but I can assure you, Commissioner, I have not the slightest intention of acceding to their demands. It's absolutely monstrous to suppose that a government minister would allow threats to influence him in carrying out his official duties. I too have official duties, and they are to protect you from harm. Until the second reading of this bill has been successfully concluded, I must insist on certain measures. And these are? You must take up residence in central London. 
Our London house is in Portland Place. So I understand. But I believe you work from offices at number 44 Downing Street. That is so. When I'm in London, I drive there every morning. If my Downing Street staff need to contact me at any time, a private telephone line connects my office with Portland Place. I'm afraid we cannot allow you to drive from Portland Place to Downing Street before the second reading is concluded. We must ask you to set up living facilities in your Downing Street office. Good grief, ma'am. Sir Philip, believe me, it is necessary. It's only a matter of a night or two. Oh, very well. I did assure Lady Raymond that I would follow your directions. Yes, what is it? Hamilton here, sir. We have everything ready for you. The bed's made up in the outer office. Oh, and there are 60 men on duty here, with 60 more standing by for when they change rosters. We're wondering when to expect you? Perhaps you've an iron safe to lock me up in when I do arrive. Goodbye, Hamilton. I'll be along shortly. I hope I'm not intruding. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Lady Raymond. No, not at all. I was just going. I'll leave Sir Philip to explain the security arrangements. Oh, don't go quite yet, Commissioner. I feel you might be interested in this letter. Our footman has just brought it to me. He found it lying just inside the front door. Oh, good heavens. It's addressed to you, my dear. Here. My dear Foreign Secretary, I send you a brief note to remind you that you have until 8.30pm tomorrow to withdraw the Aliens' expulsion bill. If you have not done so by then, if you persist in trying to obtain a second reading for it, then I am afraid we shall be forced to remove you from the parliamentary scene permanently. In short, we shall terminate your life. We seek only justice for those you seek to endanger, the four just men. Will the four just men succeed in their plot? Will Formith solve the case? Will Sir Philip Raymond live or die? The answers to these questions and much more will be revealed in part two of grade 12's production of The Four Just Men. And now, a few words from our sponsors. Are you annoyed with the minor inconveniences in life? Are things like hiccups, hangnails, and left foot bruises ruining your day? Well, Dr. Lionfraud has the solution for you. Introducing the organic, gluten-free, vegan-free, non-GMO, cure-all squid ink medicine, Dr. Lionfraud's Cold Cure. Just a spoonful of this special medicine is guaranteed to make your life 99.9% .9 better by getting rid of all of life's little annoyances. This medication may contain all nuts and is not yet FDA approved. Side effects may include blindness, internal bleeding, hearing loss, hair loss, tooth loss, purple tongue, dry mouth, wet mouth, blood clots, temporary psychosis, hallucinations, sleep paralysis, extreme sweating, rash, chronic crying, and in rare cases, temporary death. Seeing a physician is not necessary before taking this medication. Get your bottle of Dr. Lion Prod's cold cure for less than a 10 bob note. Not sold in stores. Empower the women, develop the nation, votes for women. Equality for all is the only way. Stop by Jane Raymond's Rose Shop today. Every rose purchased puts money towards the women's suffrage movement. Her fresh roses are locally grown and hand-picked with pride. Show you stand for women's suffrage, not just today, but every day, in every way. Wear a rose on your lapel as you complete your errands around town. Present a vase of a colorful array in your sitting room window. Deliver a bouquet to the strong women in your life to show how much you care. Jane Raymond's roses come in every color from cherry red to burgundy wine, along with pure white, pinks, and even yellow. Jane Raymond's Rose Shop is located on the corner of Electrocute Avenue and 4th Street. Stop by today for equality tomorrow. Are you tired of having multiple products for different uses? How can I possibly make room for any more new and exciting cleaning products? Or food? Well, now you don't have to. I don't. Introducing New Spice, the 16-in-1 soap that makes everything nice. You might be asking. What can it do? Great question. Oh. The real question is, what can't it do? Math. Can it do math? Well, no. It can't do math. 
But this innovative and compact product is a cleaner, a conditioner, and it's even edible. Practical and delicious. Tell me more. Use this soap when washing dishes, carpet cleaning, grout cleaning, car cleaning, and drain cleaning. Cleaning? It also works great to clean you and your pet. The 16-in-1 soap is a great shampoo, conditioner, body wash, moisturizer, and dog shampoo. Oh, I hope there's more. But wait, there's more. What could it possibly be left? Eating it? This soap can also be your new midnight snack. Oh, I knew it. You can eat it. Squeeze it right out of the package and into your mouth. Or freeze it and call it cheese. Grate it and put it on pasta, pizza, or tacos. With our three amazing flavors, original, strawberry, banana, and cilantro, you are guaranteed to love this life-changing 16-in-1 soap product. New Spice, the soap that makes everything nice. Now available for the low price of £2,003 through the GP Payment Portal. And now we return to the world of the four just men. Please lean in and engage as Grade 12 takes us back to the action. Thank you so much for meeting me, Elizabeth. It doesn't seem quite right to be having tea at the Savoy at a time like this. My dear Jane, you must be desperately worried. When I told Austin that you'd asked to see me, he said I simply had to put anything else to one side. So I did. It doesn't do to disobey the Prime Minister. <laughs> Dear Elizabeth, uh, how is Austin taking all this? Well, he's supporting Philip, of course. Yes, Philip is absolutely determined to go ahead with this wretched bill. I know. I'm not so sure that Austin is quite as convinced. Really? I think he'd be prepared to postpone the bill until these four just men, or whatever they call themselves, are caught. He doesn't want to seem to give way to threats, but he's afraid of what this gang can do. Oh, Elizabeth, if only he could bring Philip Brown to his way of thinking. If he announced that all efforts were being directed to apprehending these criminals, and that the government would reintroduce the bill later, surely that would be acceptable to the public? Well, I would have thought so. The question is, would Philip go along with it? Elizabeth, would you ask Austin to try? These four vigilantes, nothing seems to stop them. I'm so frightened for Philip. He's stubborn, but surely he'll listen to the Prime Minister. Austin, you don't want a political crisis on your hands, do you? Because if you insist on dropping this bill, I'll have no choice but to resign. I've invested too much in it, and I'm damned if I'll let myself be painted as a coward, prepared to give way to blackmail for fear of my life. No, Austin, unless you positively forbid it, we go ahead tomorrow night, as scheduled, with the second reading. Half past eight, Sir Philip. I'm not deaf, Hamilton. No, sir, I I'm sorry. I it's just... Uh, you don't have to spell it out, Hamilton. By this time tomorrow, unless I've withdrawn the bill, I'll be dead, according to these four just men. Uh, that's what I had in mind. Well, you can put your mind at rest, Hamilton. Neither will occur. I will not withdraw the bill, and in 24 hours' time, I'll still be in perfect health. Don't forget, half the police force in London is guarding us here in this office, and we are in Downing Street, for heaven's sake, hard by the Prime Minister's official residence. Who do you think could get past all that security? Uh, of course, you're right, sir. Hello. Hello, Philip. I was wondering if you've settled in all right. Thank you, Jane, yes. They've made up what seems a very comfortable bed, and we're surrounded by police and scores of security guards. <sighs> well, that's some comfort. To me, at least. You mustn't worry, my dear. Everything will go swimmingly. I'll stay here in the office till 8.30 tomorrow evening, then I'll be driven over to the Commons under heavy guard for the second reading. I'll be back here by 11. This private telephone line of ours is a blessing, Philip. You won't mind if I ring you from time to time? Of course not, my dear. Whenever you wish. Thank you, Philip. Well, I'll wish you good night. Sleep well. I guarantee it. Good night, Jane.
want you to understand, Terry. We bear you no ill will for what you've done. Senor Gonzalez here and Senor Pocar both agree with me. I did the right thing in sparing your life. I am grateful, Manfred. Tomorrow night, if it remains necessary, you'll do as you agreed to do. You've had half the promised sum already. We'll pay you the rest, and you'll be free to go. But where? Where can I go? Tell me. I've given them my name. They'll have contacted the Spanish police by now, and they'll know all about me. Where can I go? What am I to do? You betrayed yourself, Terry. This is the punishment you brought upon yourself. But you can stop worrying. We'll find a place for you. A new Spain, under other skies. And the girl from Jerez will be there, waiting for you. You swear that? You have my word. And now, you know what's expected of you tomorrow night. You know what's to be done. I do. There must be no mistake. If we have to, we'll kill this unjust man in a way no one will ever guess. It will shock the world. A swift death. A sure death. A death that will defeat all the police, all the security <clears> guards. <throat> I apologize, gentlemen. I got carried away. For one moment, I forgot our cause. Indeed, Manfred. The method we use to achieve justice is less important than our reasons for doing so. You're right, Gonzalez. Terry, all the equipment you need, every single item you asked for, I've laid out for you on the workbench over there. So, Terry, to work. Well, Sir Philip, we now know how that non-explosive bomb was smuggled into the Prime Minister's office. Really? Yes. That evening, Gerald Basco, the MP for North Tarrington, was spotted in the House just as members were filing into the voting lobby. And so... Mr. Basco was never within a hundred miles of the House on that day. It was one of those so-called four just men in disguise. And what a disguise! It fooled everyone, without exception. Falmouth. I'm so tired of all this, weary with it. Detectives and disguises and masked murderers. We seem to be living in a theatrical melodrama. It won't go on, sir. I do assure you. We'll catch them before too long. Please be patient for just a day or two. Will I be able to get to the Commons tonight? Not tonight, sir. That's not part of the security program. Sir Philip, I need to get back to the Scotland Yard for a short while. The Commissioner asked me to look in at about a quarter to ten. I'll be back, sir. Within the hour. I promise. Let me see you out. Hamilton, Mr. Falmouth is leaving. His coat, if you please. You must excuse these goggles of mine. I had an uncomfortable feeling a few days ago that I was being followed, so I've taken to riding my motorcycle. These goggles make me pretty indistinguishable from every other motorcyclist on the road. And I may say, Sir Philip, that this is the only time in my 25 years of service that I have ever resorted to a disguise of any sort. This situation is making fools of us all. Well, I'll see you a little later, Falmouth. Indeed, Sir Philip. Do you want me, sir? No, Hamilton. I'll be all right in the study. I think I'll read a little. Oh, Sir Philip. <clears throat> I nearly forgot. I'm sorry to bother you, but I wanted to leave this envelope with you until I got back. We can't be too careful. Accidents happen, even to detectives. Why, have you been receiving threats too? I'm afraid so, sir, and the commissioner too. This contains highly confidential information, and it'd be disastrous if anything happened to me and it was found. I'll entrust it to a courier on my return. Till then, may I leave it with you, sir? Of course. I'll put it in this drawer. Good night, Falmouth. Good night, Sir Philip. The Foreign Secretary's office. Is that you, Miss Hamilton? Indeed it is, Lady Raymond. How can I help you? Do you wish to speak with Sir Philip? He's in the study reading at the moment. I'm not sure I do. I need your advice, Miss, Miss Hamilton. Of course. We've received a letter here in Portland Place. We don't know how it was delivered. It was found on the hall map not five minutes ago. Oh dear, is it from... Yes, it's signed the four just men. I don't want to worry Sir Philip even more, but I can't keep it to myself. Of course not. Please read it to me. Sir Philip, 
You will receive one more warning from us, and to ensure that it will not go astray, our next and last message will be delivered into your hands by one of us in person, the four just men. What do you make of that? They're claiming that one of the four of them will penetrate all the security surrounding us and place a letter into Sir Philip's hands. But that's absolute nonsense, Lady Raymond. Completely impossible. Did I hear the telephone? Yes, Sir Philip. I took the call in here. I'd switched off the connection to leave you in peace. No, Hamilton. Please leave it permanently switched through to my study. I want to receive any calls from Lady Raymond. Is that her on the phone? It is, sir. Let me have it. Hello, Jane? Yes, it is, Philip. I'm sorry to bother you again. We've received the letter. Hamilton will tell you all about it. Please be extra careful, Philip, won't you? Don't worry, my dear. Now, good night. Back already, Falmouth. Just in time. There's been a development. Why don't we all go into the study? Something's happened. I've only been away for half an hour. Lady Raymond phoned from the house in Portland Place. She's using the telephone? Oh, it's quite secure. We're connected by a private line, but they received a letter there. They don't know how it was delivered. From these? Yes, sir. The four just men. What did they say? Well, it's utter nonsense. They said that one of them would personally deliver their last message into your hands, Sir Philip. They've overreached themselves this time. They're claiming to be able to achieve the impossible. Let's not bother our heads with that. The Commissioner had something of interest to tell me. He's just received a long cable from America. Remember those killings the four just men carried out in the States a few years back? Well, a Pinkerton woman has been collecting information about them ever since. Here's the cable she sent our Commissioner. Warn Raymond that the four stick by their promise. If they say they will do something, they will do it. If they mention a certain time, they will keep to him. Warn him against drinking coffee in any form or opening letters or parcel. Tell him to be accompanied at all times by an armed police officer. Examine his bedroom to ensure no gases can be introduced. And make sure an armed guard is stationed outside. These men mean what they say. Mr. Farmouth, is that this evening's megaphone you have there? Yes, I got it just outside Scotland Yard. Why? Look at the headline. The four just men explain their creed. Let's see what they have to say for themselves. Our purpose is to dispense justice when corrupt politicians or judges fail to do so. To deliver their just deserts to those responsible for committing evil who would otherwise escape justice. So we ourselves are careful to be just and meticulous at every stage. We leave nothing to chance. But if the slightest hitch occurs, then we would acknowledge defeat and abort our mission. For example, Sir so Philip Raymond must receive a final warning, and by our code, it is essential that it is handed to him by one of us in person. Unless this is done before 10 o'clock tonight, our arrangements fall to the ground, and the execution we have planned must be foregone. But it's a quarter past 10. That's Big Ben just striking. Don't you see? It's all over. There's no longer any need to guard Sir Philip. It's a ruse, a trick, surely, to put us off our guard. I don't think so. I believe that these men, ruthless as they are, really mean what they say. It's what that Pinkerton man from the States believes. It's what they themselves call their creed. In 25 years, I've never put an ounce of faith in anything any criminal says. But with this lot, somehow I can't disbelieve them. If they fail to deliver their message, they won't trouble us again. I wish I could believe that. Mr. Hamilton, sir. Telegram. Right, bring it here. Thanks. It's addressed to you, Sir Philip. I'll take it. From the editor of the megaphone, listen to this. Received a phone call from one of the four. He says they've just delivered their last message to you. Is this true? Good grief. But what does it mean? It means, my dear Mr. Falmouth, that your noble four are liars and braggarts, as well as murderers. And it also means, I hope, an end to your ridiculous faith in their honesty. Tell me, did anybody come here after I left? Not a soul. I can vouch for that, Mr. Farmer. Sir Philip, you've seen no one this evening except your secretary and myself. No one. Absolutely nobody. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to go back to the yard and try to sort out... Don't forget place. your package! What package?
The envelope you left for me for safekeeping. This. What is this? You seem bemused, Mr. Falmouth. Perhaps it's because your touching faith in the honesty of these criminals has been shattered. I really must ask the commissioner to send me a detective with a better appreciation of the criminal mind. Sir Raymond, would you please explain what you mean by saying that I handed you this envelope for safekeeping? Has the shock affected your memory as well? A moment after you left, you remembered this package and returned to leave it in my care. Sir Raymond, I assure you that I did not return, nor did I leave any envelope with you. Please hand it to me. This, Sir Raymond, is your final warning from the four just men. But you delivered it. I most certainly did not, Mr. Hamilton. That was one of them. Dressed in a long coat like mine, with goggles on. Sir Philip, the four have done precisely what they said they would do. Their final message has been handed to you, in person. We allow you, until tomorrow evening, to reconsider your decision regarding the aliens' extradition bill. If, by six o'clock, no announcement has appeared in the afternoon papers that you have withdrawn this measure, we shall, with reluctance, fulfill our promise. You will be dead by 8.30. Beneath this note, I set out, in brief, the secret police arrangements for your safety. Farewell, the four just men. Austin, this has gone on far enough. Can you imagine what dear Jane is going through? You must put a stop to this. If only I could, Elizabeth. But these men mean what they say, and they seem capable of doing anything they put their mind to. If that bill isn't withdrawn, I do honestly believe that Philip will lose his life. It simply isn't worth it. I agree with you, my dear, I do. But you know Philip, he's stubborn as a mule. He's absolutely determined not to be shifted, especially by threats. But you're the prime minister. You lead the government. You could simply order the bill to be postponed until these criminals are caught. Elizabeth, let me explain. If he's not allowed to proceed with this legislation, Philip is threatened to resign. The party simply can't face a political upheaval at this time. The government would fall. We'd have to call a general election. And if I'm any judge of the public mood, there's every chance we'd lose it. I can't risk all that. Nor can I really be seen to have given way to the threats and blackmail of a gang of international criminals. I have to keep the broader picture in mind. I do understand, Austin. Indeed I do. With my head. My heart urges me in quite a different direction. Is there no room for the heart in politics, Austin? It's a question of balancing one course of action against another, and judging what the consequences of each are likely to be. We've placed an unprecedented cordon around Philip. The police and security services of the nation are intent on safeguarding him, at no little cost, I may say. The likelihood of anything happening to him has been reduced to a minimum. Whereas, if he resigns, the political consequences are only too clear. As PM, is this sort of difficult decision I'm called on to make all the time. You had your weekly audience with the Queen yesterday evening. Did Her Majesty have anything to say? She began as you did, my dear. She inquired whether the bill could be postponed, and I explained the full situation, just as I've explained it to you. She accepted that my decision was logical and reasonable. I know that you're doing your best, Austin. I do trust you to make the right decisions. All we can do now is wait and hope. May I ask the Prime Minister whether it is the intention of Her Majesty's government to proceed with the Aliens Extradition Bill? In view of the extraordinary circumstances that have arisen, has he considered postponing the measure? I know of no circumstance likely to prevent my right honorable friend, who is unfortunately not in his place tonight, from moving the second reading of the bill tomorrow. Have you seen the morning papers, Falmouth? Haven't had time, ma'am. I didn't sleep very well in Downing Street, and I came straight here. Well, they're unanimous that the bill should be dropped. Not one of them thinks Sir Philip is doing the right thing. One way or another, they're all saying that the bill is not important enough to risk a life for. But public opinion is pretty divided about the bill itself. That's true. The split nearly 50-50, but whatever they think about the measure, everyone seems to believe that Sir Philip would be foolhardly to go ahead regardless. And I must say, I agree with them. And so do I. Killing Sir Philip would seem to be an impossible task, given the degree of security we've laid on. We're going to keep him isolated until it's time to get him to the Commons this evening. No one will be allowed to approach him. And yet... And yet... 
You think these forged men can achieve even the impossible? What seems impossible to us may be achievable by them. Perhaps we haven't thought out every possible way they could get at him. That's your job, Falmouth. Think away. As for me, I'm going round to see Sir Philip. I tell you, sir, we can do no more than we've done, and I'm still afraid. If you look out to the window, you can see a small section of Whitehall. I assure you that it is packed end to end with police. We've banned all traffic in the area covered by Charles Street, Birdcage Walk, and the Mall. We've men up the roofs. We've searched every house. It sounds like martial law. Close. In fact, two guards' regiments will be under arms for the rest of today and tonight, ready for any emergency. Overkill, wouldn't you say? Let me be quite honest with you, Sir Philip. These four criminals frighten me. I'll admit this to no one else, but I have a horrible dread that, despite all of our precautions, we've left something out of our reckoning. That we failed to see some way in which they could get to you. That despite all of our security, you are still vulnerable. Sir Philip, for God's sake, I beg of you, think well before you reject their terms. Is the timeable for this bill so absolutely necessary? Is it worth your life? Commissioner, I will not withdraw, not under any circumstances. I have gone too far. I have got beyond fear. To me, it's now a question of right and wrong. Is it wrong to remove from this country scores of dangerous criminals who enjoy immunity from arrest while encouraging others to commit acts of violence and treason? I firmly believe that I am in the right to do so. And if that's the case, then the four just men are in the wrong. I trust my own judgment in this matter. That is why I must proceed with the bill. Thank you, Sir Philip. I understand. You are quite right to take the precautions you have, Commissioner. I have been foolish to resent them. We must tighten them further, sir. Between six and half past eight this evening, we wish you to remain here, in your study, to lock the door and under no circumstances to open it to anyone, anyone at all, not even to myself or Mr. Falmouth. During that time, you must keep the door locked. Will you do that, sir? I'll follow your instructions to the letter. This room cannot be breached in any way. During the night, it has been subject to a thorough inspection. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, the fixed steel shutters, nothing can get through. I'll leave you now, Sir Philip, but Mr. Falmouth and I will be back at six o'clock this evening. And at half past eight? We leave a parliament under heavy guard. That's the plan. Please God we're able to carry it out. Hello, my dear. Yes, it's me. Are you alright? Is everything going to plan? I'm afraid it is. I've been locked in this study all alone for half an hour already. They intend keeping me locked up in here till 8.30. Thank heaven for that. It's only two hours, my love. It's already half past six. I've told them I'll grin and bear it. I've given up complaining. I suppose it's all for the best. I'm sure it is. I take it you want to be coming back to Portland Place after the debate? No. They intend to keep me under close guard until tomorrow. I'll sleep here in Downing Street tonight. Then, I'll see you later tomorrow. I wish you well in the debate. Thank you, Jane. Well, good night. Good night, Philip. Gonzalez. It's no good. He's gone. But why? What happened? Terry bungled the job. It's as simple as that. He bungled 
and he's paid the price. But Ramon, what of Raymond? We shall see. We shall see. A quarter past eight. Another fifteen minutes. Just let me. Sir Philip, are you all right, sir? Perfectly. Thank you, Hamilton. Excellent, sir. We'll soon have you out of there. Yes, it really does look as though this nightmare will soon be over. Please, Commissioner, don't let's count our chickens before they've hatched. You know what I think about these gangsters, what they're capable of achieving. But even you must admit, Falmouth, it looks as though this time they've bitten off more than they can chew. I do admit, Commissioner, that I can't think of what might happen. I don't see how it's possible for these fellows to keep their promise. But all the same, nagging at the back of my mind... Yes, Falmouth, I know what you mean. I'll just listen at the door. Nothing. Wait, was that the telephone? It's half past eight. It's all over. Sir Philip, you can unlock the door. Get this door open. You two out there, lend a hand. Right. One, two, three. My God! Sir Philip, Sir Philip! He's dead. I must get straight over to the Prime Minister. Thalmuth, keep everyone out of this room. Come on, all of you, out! Does that include the outer office? Yes! See to it, Falmouth, will you? Get the outer door locked. Make this building secure, then you can join me in number 10. What about Lady Raymond, ma'am? Somebody will have to break the news. I'll do that, as soon as I've informed the Prime Minister. Get moving, everyone! May I remind everyone present that this is in no sense a trial. An inquest is a formal method of attempting to reach the truth about a certain circumstance, often a death. You, gentlemen of the jury, <coughs> are asked to listen carefully to the evidence placed before you and then on my guidance as coroner to reach a verdict. You have listened to a great deal of evidence, but I must tell you that so far I do not believe you can decide the exact cause of Sir Philip Raymond's death. Or rather, to put it another way, we have no means of determining exactly how Sir Philip was murdered. For, gentlemen of the jury, <coughs> I believe you can go this far. Namely that Sir Philip did not die of natural causes. His death was caused by person or persons unknown and by means which so far remain equally mysterious. Before I call Detective Superintendent Falmouth to give evidence, I would like to record that I have received a great many letters from all kinds of people containing a great many theories as to the cause of Sir Philip's death, some of them fantastic beyond belief. I have passed them all on to the police who inform me that they are eager to receive suggestions, no matter how bizarre. And now, call Detective Superintendent Falmouth. Yes, sir. The windows were fastened and were covered with tightly closed wooden shutters sheathed with steel. I examined them carefully. There was absolutely no indication that they had been tampered with. Did you institute a search of the room? I did, sir. A thorough search. <clears throat> the foreman of the jury has <coughs> her hand up. You have a question, Ms. <laughs> foreman? Yes, <coughs> sir. Some members of the jury would like to know when the room was examined. How soon after the discovery of the body? As soon as the forensic team had completed their work and the body was removed. Every article of furniture was taken out of the room, the carpets were taken up, and the walls and ceiling stripped. And nothing was found? Nothing. Is there a fireplace in the room? There is, sir. And it was subject to a thorough search. It had not been disturbed. There was no soot on the ground. There was no possibility at all of anyone gaining entry to the room. 
by that means. <sighs> yes, Ms. Foreman? Excuse me, sir, but may I ask the witness if there was any indication of gas when he entered the room? A smell, perhaps? Nothing of any sort. But there are gases that are poisonous, but without any odor. Indeed there are, but I was inside the room within seconds of hearing Sir Philip fall to the ground. No gas could dissipate as quickly as that. I would certainly have detected it if it had been present. Did you find anything unusual? Well, sir, in falling to the floor, Sir Philip swept a number of items from his desk, including a small bowl of roses. He was found to be clutching one of the roses. This was included in the commissioner's report to me. There was something odd about Sir Philip's hand, was there not? Yes, sir. Beneath the flower, there was a round black stain. Can you account for that? No, sir. I have no explanation for it. I... I had those roses sent over to Downing Street about mid-morning. <laughs> they were picked in our own gardens of the country and sent up to London by the milk train. I included a little note with my love. Then I can well understand why Sir Philip may have clutched at one in his dying moments. <sighs> Thank you for that, Commissioner. But I'm absolutely certain they could not have caused his death. Look, over there on the grand piano. Those are some of the precisely the same roses. You must have examined the ones in Philip's room. Indeed we did, Lady Raymond. They were sent to the Home Office for analysis, and of course, we found nothing out of the way. Detective Superintendent Falmouth, I believe you know of a man called Terry? I do, sir. He was one of the gang calling themselves the Four Just Men. We believe he was involved in the plot to murder Sir Philip Raymond. Has he been found? Yes, sir. His body was discovered this morning, on the Romney Marshes. Was there anything particularly significant about it? Yes, sir. On his right palm, there was a stain similar to the one found on Sir Philip Raymond's hand. <sighs> yes, Ms. Foreman. Was a rose also found in his hand? No. His hands were empty. Did the forensic report on these stains suggest how they might have been caused? Not really. Carbolic acid was suggested, but other than that, they remain a mystery. Before you stand down, Detective Superintendent, is there any other circumstance that you wish to bring to the attention of the court? Any matter that I may have failed to ask you about? Well, something that can have no possible bearing on the case. But in examining the exterior of 44 Downing Street soon after Sir Philip's death... Yes. I hesitate to mention it, but I found two dead sparrows on the windowsill outside Sir Philip's study. Two dead sparrows? Yes, sir. Did you send them away for examination and analysis? I did, sir. The forensic surgeon who examined them found no trace of poison in either the stomach or the lungs. In his report, he suggested they died of exposure and fallen from the parapet above. He did not believe that the birds had any connection to Sir Philip's murder. <coughs> Gentlemen of the jury, <coughs> gentle people of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are, sir. Although our verdict is unprecedented, we find that Sir Philip Raymond died from an unknown cause, but that he was willfully murdered by a person or persons unknown. Hello, Carson. Wouldn't have expected to find you here. Don't your bankruptcies keep you busy enough? Plenty of businesses seem to be going bust just now. Oh, <laughs> I took time off. Fascinating affair. Isn't it? Extraordinary. Were you in court all the time? I was. Did you notice what a bright foreman we had? Indeed. She'd make a smarter lawyer than she is a businesswoman. Why? Do you know her? 
I do, poor devil. Took Etherington's the printers off our hands. Thought she was going to set the Thames on fire. Now we've got it back. Said she made a mistake. Can't make a go of it. She says she doesn't like the English weather either. She's off to sunnier climes. What's her name now? Her name? Oh yes, Manfred. They beat us, Falmouth. There's no denying it. But how did they do it? That's the question. And this letter doesn't help. Letter, Commissioner? This has arrived here before you did. How did it get here? Who delivered it? No, no. It came in the mail, with Her Majesty's portrait in the top right-hand corner of the envelope. Listen, when you receive this, we, who for for want of a better title, call ourselves the four just men, will be scattered throughout Europe. Don't bother trying to catch us. You are most unlikely to succeed. I write to tell you that though we did what we said we would, it was with the utmost regret. Sir Philip Raymond's death could have been avoided. One thing did go wrong with our carefully laid plans. Terry died through an accident. We depended too much on his technical knowledge. He bungled and paid the price. Perhaps, after the most careful investigation, you will manage to solve the mystery of how Sir Philip Raymond met his death alone in a locked room, sealed from the outside world. Then you will understand also how it was that our colleague Terry met his end. Farewell, the the four four just just men. men. This tells us nothing. Careful investigation. We've torn the house in Downing Street apart. We searched it from end to end. Then let's widen the search. Have you examined the Ramon house in Portland Place? No. Lady Raymond is in residence. No, no. She's gone back to the country. It's unoccupied at the moment, except for the housekeeper. Go over there now, Falmouth. Search the place. Everything is just as Sir Philip left it, sir. The lawyers are due to make an inventory tomorrow. I believe Lady Raymond is going to sell up. I'd like to start with the study. I'll lead the way, sir. It's up on the first floor. No, sir, this staircase. It leads straight to the study door. Lady Raymond locked it before she left for the country. Here we are. Please come in. I'll just pull back the curtains, let in some light. That's better. Oh, good heavens. What's happened to that table? The wood's all blistered. Never mind the table. Just look at that telephone. It's as though it's been struck by lightning. Is this Sir Philip's private line to Downing Street? That's right, sir. Touch nothing. Lock this door again as soon as I leave. Let no one into this room. Do you understand? No one at all. Sir Philip was electrocuted. They tapped into the wire that led direct from the Portland Place house to Sir Philip's study in Downing Street. But Lady Raymond was living in Portland Place. They didn't need to get into the house. Once they'd identified the private line, they could tap into it at any point. They planned to use that wire to convey a killing current of electricity from end to end. But something went wrong. At the crucial moment, Derry bungled. The surge of current that reached Portland Place was way in excess of what he had intended. And it killed him outright. In Downing Street, I thought I heard the telephone ring briefly. Sir Philip must have picked up the receiver and the shock he received was enough to stop his heart and kill him. That scorch mark on his hand had nothing to do with the rose he clutched at. And the two dead sparrows? They may well have been roosting on the wire itself when the charge went through. The four just men indeed. My right honorable friend was a man of principle. He believed that giving sanctuary to men intent on disruption and revolution in their own countries was wrong. He believed that criminals and anarchists were taking advantage of our traditional tolerance, and that when friendly governments asked us to repatriate them to their own countries, we should comply. For that reason, and to honor the memory of a very brave man that I was proud to call friend, I have decided to take the alien's extradition bill through to its second reading myself. The debate will take place tomorrow evening at 8.30.